the pinnacle of success for Welsh farm boy Roger Glover came with this, Deep Purple's most famous song. It was the centrepiece of their biggest selling album, Machine Head. The album was due to be recorded at a Lake Geneva casino when it burned down. Smoke in the water, the words came to me a couple of days after the fire uh, in a sort of half awake state. I, was, I woke up in bed and I said out loud to an empty room, smoke on the water, and then I opened my eyes. And I, did I just say something? What did I just say? Smoke on the water? What the hell's that? Together, Roger Glover and Ian Gillen penned what was to become one of the best known rock songs ever. The song pushed Deep Purple ahead of their closest rivals, Led Zeppelin, to make them the world's biggest rock band. We did six separate tours of America in 72, and an album, and a tour of Europe, and a tour of Japan. I mean, just, it was nuts, really. Caught up in the chaos of their success, the band began to fall apart. Roger Glover became the main victim for pranks pulled by the rest of the band. Oh, we used to try and throw him out of vans and cars, but he always kept coming back. We put him out on the fourth road bridge once, tied him up, and he still got back to the hotel. We were bored and we had done a gig and our energy level was still high, hadn't dissipated, and we were young. And uh, so we pounced on Roger as the radio wasn't working. They tied him up and dumped him out of the limousine before relenting, picking him up again and apologising. But he wouldn't accept our apology. And we got up to the hotel and we, we wouldn't let him out of the car until he accepted our apology. And he said, all right, okay, okay, fine, let's go to the bar and have a drink. So our apology is accepted then, he said, yes, fine. So then we pounced on him and then we stripped him, stark naked, and kicked him out of the car. And uh, you see, only Roger could do it. And he strode up the steps of the hotel, the posh hotel, stark naked. We walked in behind him and he walked through the swing doors, walked up to the reception desk and asked for his key and walked off to the lift. And we came in behind him and there was a frozen tableau of uh, sort of dinner-seated guests holding glasses of champagne or whatever. It, it was incredible, just incredible. But sometimes the horseplay between band members was more destructive. One particular incident happened in an ancient mansion in Devon and involved unpredictable guitarist Richie Blackmore. Richie was going to have a seance in sort of fairly close to the room where I was sleeping. And he came and knocked on my door after about half an hour. Um, it must have been, I suppose, one in the morning now. And he said, can we borrow your crucifix? I used to wear a crucifix then, for no reason particularly. I was just, someone had given it to me, I liked it. And I said, um, actually, no. Uh, I don't want anything to do with what you're doing. You know, Good night. Closed the door, went back to my book. And there was an almighty crash. And I saw the head of an axe disappearing. It had come through my door. And it was being jemmied back out again. And a couple of seconds later, and the whole panel came out of the door, and this axe was there. What the? Leapt out of bed in my underwear, went to what was left of the door and opened it, and saw Richie running away. Furious at Blackmore's behavior, Glover picked up a chair leg and chased the guitarist through the eerie corridors. He eventually cornered him. And in my anger, I didn't really know what I was doing, and I came to, and I had my one hand round Richie's throat, and the other holding this chair leg, and I was just, I was going to brain him. And then I sort of suddenly re and he's going, Rog, it's me, Rog. And I went, ah. Said something really weak, like, don't ever do that again, and stalked off to my room. Blackmore's erratic behavior and Gillen's heavy drinking made for an uneasy atmosphere in the band, but their success continued. And by 73, we were, we were the biggest band in the world. Uh, Billboard magazine, I've still got the plaques. We were the number one group sales and number one album sales of everyone. We sold more than Zeppelin, the Beatles, the Presley, you name it, that year. Um, and it's how ironic that we did
deteriorated. I mean, we become so dysfunctional that Ian Gillan and Richie just weren't talking. Richie and I used to squabble. So Roger would always go, well, look at it from his point of view. I go, <laughs> what? Why? <laughs> um, it doesn't make any sense. And so he'd say to Richie, you know, the same thing. And Richie you know, doesn't know what he's talking about. So. But Roger would always intervene and be there, sort of <laughs> working to keep us apart. I suppose the rock and roll lifestyle kind of took its toll. Going on stage night after night after night and taking it for granted that 15, 20,000 people would go nuts because by that time we were playing arenas. Um, and I remember thinking, it doesn't really matter how well I play because the band was kind of chaotic anyway. They were going nuts for us. What difference did it make? And I, and I think when you get reach that point, really, it's, it's, it's all over. And I put my fist through a glass window and I just found myself in a gutter, just going nuts and crying, un uncontrollably crying. With Deep Purple disintegrating, Richie Blackmore threatened to quit. And I had no idea uh, how bad it was until I realised that no one was talking to me anymore. Uh, no one was talking to me? Why? I was left out in the cold. And I was just really depressed. I knew something was up. Basically, Richie decided to stay, but only if I left. And I could never figure out why. I'd never had any bad things with Richie. Richie said not a word to me, except on the stairs of that last gig. I was going up and he was going down, and he paused and he said, by the way, uh, it's not personal, it's business. And carried on. And I was sort of stunned, actually. Oh. And it was very emotional, that last gig. I remember being in tears at the end of it. It was the end of an era. It was the end of every, oh, you know, nearly four years of this magic, which then became madness. When the band announced they were splitting up, the Japanese fans rioted, laying waste to the stadium in Osaka. Ever since school, I'd been on a stage. And here I am at the ripe old age of, what was I, 28 or something like that. And suddenly, over the cliff, <laughs> nothing. It was six years before Glover joined another band. He was asked to join Rainbow, bizarrely by the man who'd forced him out of Deep Purple, Richie Blackmore. But Rainbow never matched the success or madness of Deep Purple. In 1984, Deep Purple reformed. Although we were concerned about making a good album, at least I was, all that concerned the band was going down the pub. And we spent more time in the pub than in the studio. And it was, more, and it was wonderful to see, I mean, to see Richie and Ian Gillen having a meal together and laughing and forgetting the past and all that bad stuff from the past. Of course, it couldn't last. That album was great, but the next album, you know, the, the old divisions kept coming back and, and sure enough, we went into a, a period of decline, which went on for about 10 years. Whatever. Yeah, in 1987, Roger fell in love with the former wife of Cardiff rock star Dave Edmonds. He invited her and her sons to visit him at his home in America. He booked us on a flight, and the day before he called to say, are you excited about coming? And the boys were jumping up and down, and I said, oh, gosh, tomorrow I don't know how I'm going to deal with the boys before we leave, because they're going to be so excited. And the flight, I think, was around 1 o'clock, so he said, you know, I'll change the flight. And uh, thank God he did, because the flight that we were booked on was the Lockerbie flight that went down. And I thought, well, what's important in my life? I just almost lost something that was really that important to me, and it, that's when I proposed to her. Today, Deep Purple are still touring the world. They have a new guitarist and keyboard player, and their latest album, Bananas, looks set to become their biggest seller for 15 years.
The infighting that tore the band apart 30 years ago is now history. I would die for Roger. I mean, I, I have no plans to, but I, 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 would, I would step in front of a runaway bus if necessary. I just wanted one hit. I just wanted to be number one once in my life. And, you know, here I am all these years later. How can I not think it's, you know, good fortune? It's only life.